Hey, this is Josh Levine, the host of One Year. I hope you're enjoying our season on 1955. This week, we have a story from senior producer Evan Chung. In 1955, Gary Foreman would have an experience that would alter the course of his life. I was all of five years old, and I remember exactly what happened, when it happened. Let me set the scene. Gary's family had just moved north to settle in a new and unfamiliar terrain. My parents were very much like pioneers. They were determined to make a home for us, wherever that was. They were helping blaze a trail that would forever transform the American landscape, a frontier known as suburbia. An important change has taken place in American life. The suburbs. A catalyst of such power and magnitude that its force will continue to stimulate our national economy far beyond my ability to forecast. Thanks to massive government investment, millions of families, at least white middle-class ones, were able to build their dream homes. Young couples with their baby boom children were staking claims on the edges of cities, places like Racine, Wisconsin, where Gary's family moved. We were one of the first houses in what became our new neighborhood. They just faintly outlined where the streets were. (laughs) Most of them were gravel and dirt roads. So anytime we had a good rain, everything flooded. It was very much like living on the edge on the frontier. It was. But it didn't stay barren for long. Houses went up fast. It became a big construction site, which also turned into a great playground for kids. And we made a habit of getting dirty and muddy just about every single day. And it was after one of those adventures that Gary had his transformative experience. I just remember that time of day, I wonder how the lights were on. It was dusk, and I had just come in from outside and said goodbye to my friends. And all of a sudden, as I was coming in from the TV set, I heard the chorus saying, Born on a mountaintop, Tennessee. Born on a mountaintop in Tennessee. Green estate in the land of the free. Raised in the woods so he knew every tree. Killed him a bar when he was only three. Davy, Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier. And when they said Davy, Davy Crockett, oh my God. It just hit me like something about that name. It tingled me. And I knew I had a rush to the TV. There it was. It was one of those moments I'll never forget. It initiated a whole new journey that I didn't know was there. Gary wasn't the only kid who found himself transfixed. More than a century after his death at the Alamo, Davy Crockett became the most famous man in America. He was everywhere in 1955, on TV screens, in jukeboxes, and on playgrounds filled with children in coonskin caps. Nobody saw this coming. Not the kids who started the craze, not the parents whose money fueled it, and least of all, Walt Disney, the legendary studio head who created it, but was preoccupied with a far riskier project. But once the Crockett phenomenon took hold, American culture would never be the same. It was the star event of the 1950s, easily. Kids imitate what they see on TV, millions and millions of them. The Union of Soviet Socialist Republics had atomic bombs, but we were safe as long as Davy Crockett was nearby. This is one year, 1955. The Crockett Craze. This episode is brought to you by SAP. Welcome to the window, the window of opportunity, when your next move can either make your business famous or obsolete. So you need to be ready. Be handling good surprises and bad ones ready. Be opening a Portland, Houston, and Providence location on the same day ready. Be stock options plus paid family leave ready. SAP has been there. It can help you be ready for anything that happens next, because it will. Be ready with SAP. The Davy Crockett craze was not born on a mountaintop in Tennessee. 
It began on a studio lot in Burbank, California. The Disney studios are different from any other Hollywood studio. From the moment you walk through the huge entrance gates, you become part of a friendly, closely integrated group of workers. When a reporter toured the studio for an Australian radio show, she found nothing but cheerful employees eager to heap praise on their boss, Walt Disney. He's a human dynamo. He stimulates her thinking and brings out ideas we never knew we even had before. Walt himself portrayed his underlings as a merry band of hi-ho whistling problem solvers. <laughs> you know, we've been at this business for a long time, and every day something new comes up to baffle us. But as long as we can get a few laughs out of it, we're happy. But the truth was, the Walt Disney Studios were anything but happy. We think of today as Disney owning like Star Wars and Marvel and Pixar. In the late 40s and the early 1950s, Disney was not a juggernaut of media. Todd J. Pierce is a professor at Cal Poly University and has published several books on the history of Disney. It's the most minor of the studios in Hollywood. There were some years where it had no feature film at all. It hadn't started off that way. In the late 1930s and early 40s, Disney made classic after classic. Snow White, Pinocchio, Fantasia, Dumbo, Bambi. But World War II devastated the studio's ambitions. The films that are produced during the war, they contain shorts or featurettes. There's nothing that's one continuous story because that's far more expensive to produce. The struggles continued even after the war ended. Disney was in the red and sputtering out forgettable movies like Fun and Fancy Free, Melody Time, and So Dear to My Heart. The studio, which had recently gone public, laid off nearly a third of its workforce. And now that he had a board of directors to answer to, Walt Disney felt like he'd lost control of the company that bore his name. And so Walt is no longer the overall manager of the studio, which frustrates him. He wants to have something over which he has creative control. Heading into the 1950s, Walt seemed disengaged at work and dejected. He would often lash out at his employees. Some of them secretly called him the Wounded Bear. His wife worried that he was headed toward a nervous breakdown. But then, finally, he found that new thing to get excited about. Miniature trains. All aboard. He started with a store-bought tabletop set, but he wasn't content with that for long. He wanted his own train, big enough to ride. And so he creates this one-eighth scale steam locomotive. Walt was working on the railroad at every available moment, fabricating parts at the studio machine shop late into the night. He'd found not only a new purpose, but a new obsession, a literal one-track mind. He even bought a new family home to accommodate the railroad. Three months were spent excavating my backyard to fit the plan of the layout. Walt invited all kinds of people to ride his train. Movie stars, writers, even Salvador Dali. But not all his guests found it charming. The film critic Bosley Crowther said that he came away feeling sad. He wrote that he found Walt wholly, almost weirdly concerned with his railroad and that, disturbingly, all of his zest for invention, for creating fantasies, seemed to be going into this plaything. Lots of people come over to Walt's house and are very confused why a person that oversees a studio is creating these small amusements in his backyard. It, it does have the feel of a midlife crisis. Lots of people read it that way. But for Walt, the train in his backyard wasn't just a train. His model railroad was the prototype for a much grander project. Walt Disney was going to build an amusement park. And not some old-fashioned place like Coney Island with its carnies and roller coasters. He was dreaming up submarines, stagecoaches, and rocket ships. His vision was sharpening into something radical. His idea is that Americans are going to want to spend the entire day in different areas that look like movie sets. You could step foot into a Western or into a jungle picture. There could be a science fiction land and a world of fantasy. What Walt Disney was inventing 
was the modern theme park. No one's done this yet. In the 1950s, there's really nothing that's like this that exists. Walt found what he thought was the perfect location outside the small town of Anaheim, California, even though there wasn't much of a population there to speak of. There really wasn't much of anything but orange groves. There's not even a freeway yet. It's really in the middle of nowhere. But Walt was making a bet that Anaheim wouldn't stay isolated forever. He recognized that the country's suburban explosion was not going to stop. And few areas would grow faster than Orange County, the home of Anaheim. For the tremendous development and progress of this amazing area, coupled with its usually pleasant climate, has brought a never-ending stream of population pouring into Los Angeles and the surrounding area. Now he had settled on a location, a vision, and a name. Disneyland. But there was one thing that Walt didn't have. Oh, money. Money. (laughs) He doesn't have the money for it. And it is a tremendous investment. Walt Disney Productions had annual profits of around $500,000. The estimated price tag for Disneyland ran up to $10 million. That is 20 or so years of profit for what this park is going to cost. And it's an incredibly risky venture. Borrowing the money wasn't really an option. The studio was already in massive debt. There is no bank that's going to give an unsecured loan, even to Walt Disney, to build a very large amusement park on farmland that's very far from the center of L.A. Walt desperately needed some other source to fund the construction. And then it came to him. The answer is TV. Television. Television, the ultimate triumph in man's search for sight beyond the range of the human eye. In the early 50s, TV was growing at an astounding rate. It was on the verge of reaching the majority of American households. Yes, in little more than a wink of time, television has entered our homes, our lives, and all this has been just the beginning. Walt can see that this is a trend moving very quickly forward, and there's going to be money here. Walt Disney Productions was going to do something that no significant movie studio had ever taken on they were going to make a TV show for whichever network paid the right price. But part of the deal here is they also have to guarantee a loan that's going to allow for the construction of Disneyland. As Walt explained in a 1965 speech, the meeting with the head of NBC didn't go so hot. He said, I want your television show, but he says, why do I have to take that damn amusement park? (laughs) The same thing went for CBS. For Disney, this was very bad news. CBS and NBC were the two giants of the TV industry. There was a third network Disney hadn't really been considering, for good reason. ABC didn't have even a quarter of the stations that NBC did, and it was in a struggle for survival. It's a make-it-or-break-it moment for ABC. Their future doesn't look very good, and they're going to have to make some gambles. ABC needed the television show so damn bad (laughs) that they bought the amusement park. (laughs) Now Disney just had to make the show. For Walt, one thing was certain. The series had to advertise the park, even down to the title. Walt Disney's Disneyland. Disneyland The Show premiered on October 27, 1954, with a sneak peek at his bold new construction project. That's it, right here. Disneyland, seen from about 2,000 feet in the air and 10 months away. Nobody really knew what it was, so he had to show the building of the park. Margaret King is the director of the Center for Cultural Studies and Analysis. As a historian, she studied theme parks extensively. And as a kid in the 50s, she marveled at those early Disneyland episodes. What he did was to make everybody who was watching that show, he was making them stockholders in the whole theme park project. We hope that through our television shows that you will join us and take part in the building of Disneyland. Even the structure of the show was a park promotion. It was an anthology series, with each episode representing one of Disneyland's distinct worlds. The Fantasyland segment might showcase a fairy tale cartoon. 
Adventureland, a thrilling nature film. But he needed to figure something out for Frontierland. This was the part of Disneyland inspired by Western films and meant to evoke the country's mythic past. Walt wanted to feature an American folk hero, Johnny Appleseed or Bigfoot Wallace. He didn't know who. So his production staff picked someone almost at random, a minor historical figure named Davy Crockett. Who was the real Crockett? <laughs> well, that's hard to say because he was the master of the tall tale. We know that David Crockett was born in the backwoods of North Carolina in 1786. He served in the Tennessee militia during the Creek War. He entered local politics and eventually got elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. It was through his campaign literature that he began to invent his public persona as a frontier adventurer turned fish out of water rube. He purposefully positions himself that way. He says, you know, I'm just folks, and I don't know how you do things here. And it's a way of caricaturing what he considered the pretense in, in the social life of Washington, D.C. Crockett's colorful and highly embellished autobiographies made him a well-known figure in his day. But what vaulted him into legend was the journey he took to Texas in 1836. His stand and death at the Alamo, his martyrdom, that really made him part of the pantheon of heroes. And his passage into myth and folklore is where he stayed until Disney brought him back. To play Davy Crockett, Walt cast an unknown, a lanky six foot five Texan named Fess Parker. He'd spotted Parker in the movie Them, a creature feature about giant rampaging ants. I know that sounds crazy, but that's what they were shaped like. The big one was maybe 15 feet long and had wings like a fly or something. Like scared me out of my pants. Excuse me, ma'am. The role of Davy's sidekick, Georgie Russell, went to Buddy Ebsen, who would later star as Jed Clampett on the Beverly Hillbillies. With the cast set, the shooting began, not on a cheap soundstage, but on location in the Great Smoky Mountains. The expense would be worth it, if Disneyland the show generated enough buzz for Disneyland the park. Because they were going to need a lot of visitors to pay the whole thing off. Disney has wildly underestimated how much it's going to cost to develop this park. Money is short, and the costs keep going up week after week. Walt Disney himself was at great financial risk. To pay for the park, he'd personally taken on loans and sold his life insurance policy. There were certainly those voices in the press that were predicting doom for Walt, that this is going to be Walt's folly. This will be the one that finally brings Walt down. The doubts were beginning to gnaw at him. In December 1954, Walt went out to Anaheim to take stock of the project he'd staked his future on. With less than seven months to go until opening day, not a single building had been constructed. And all around him, all he can see is just bare dirt. One of his artists noticed that this is one of the rare times that he's seen Walt move to the point where he's almost crying. And Walt says that he has half the money spent and nothing to show for it. But Walt Disney's fortunes were just about to change. I'm David Crockett, fresh from the backwoods. I got the fastest horse, the prettiest sister, the surest rifle, and the ugliest dog in Tennessee. We'll be back in a minute. At the end of your first year, Discover credit cards automatically double all the cash back you've earned. That's right. Everything you've earned doubled. All the cash back from eating at your favorite soup dumpling restaurant doubled. All the cash back from that trip where you sort of learned to snowboard also doubled. And the best part, you don't have to do anything ridiculous to get it. Nope, Discover does it automatically. Seriously, though, see terms and check it out for yourself at discover.com slash match. On December 15th, 1954, American kids would receive an early Christmas present they didn't realize they wanted. Nine-year-old Bill Chimerka was one of those kids. That evening, 
he was sitting in his living room in Union City, New Jersey, when his family tuned in to the latest episode of Disneyland. You know, in glorious black and white, rabbit ears strategically positioned to pick up the best signal. And then the show is introduced. Presenting this week from, from Frontierland, Frontier Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett, Indian fighter. And then that's the beginning of it all. There on the screen is Davy Crockett, along with his trusty companion, Georgie Russell. Dressed in a buckskin jacket and a coonskin cap, Davy says goodbye to his wife, Polly, before they head off to fight. You're a mighty pretty little woman, Mrs. Crockett, but you'd be a terror for looks with your hair all sculpted off. Off they go, and five minutes later, he's in, you know, a knife fight with a bear in the bushes. Yee-hoo! Give him a fur, Davy! I'm going, wow, this is cool. I don't think, you know, Hopalong Cassidy ever tangled with a bear. And then it just got better after that. Severely outnumbered by a Creek war party, Davy uses his cunning to win a thrilling battle. Finally, he negotiates a peace with a renegade Indian chief. Join the other chiefs in a treaty. Do that, and I promise the government will let you go back and live in peace on your own lands. Promise is no good. White government lie. Davy Crockett don't lie. When I saw the credits roll, I was stunned. Five-year-old Gary Foreman took it all in in his suburban home in Wisconsin. That story triggered something for me, and I knew I had to see more. It was just amazing, just absolutely amazing. Because the next day, my, my friends were like going crazy. Oh. Everybody was talking about David Crockett. That was great. Did you see? Yeah, that was great. Did you see when he? Yeah, that was great. It kept over and over again. So you have this internal word of mouth momentum building up for the next uh, episode. Can it be as good as this? They would have to wait more than a month to find out. The second episode wouldn't premiere until January 26th, 1955. I think the term buzz would be an understatement. No matter what homework was assigned, no matter what else was on TV, Davy Crockett was going to be watched yet again. Well, I was with our neighbors because we didn't have a television. That's cultural historian Margaret King again. As a kid, it didn't matter where she had to go. She needed to find out what was going to happen next. Oh, I certainly did. Everybody did. Everyone I knew. In episode two, the setting shifts away from the frontier and into the legislature. Crockett, I want you to run for Congress. Congress? General, you sure an old head wounded and troubling you just a little? He's wearing, you know, the, the tail coat and the vest of a gentleman, and it kind of threw me off to see Davy so dressed up. I, I thought, uh, hopefully the rest of the series is not gonna have him wearing these dude clothes. Not to worry. Soon, Davy's back in his buckskins with his coonskin cap on the floor of Congress making an impassioned speech against Andrew Jackson's Indian Removal Act. Mr. Speaker, expansion ain't no excuse for persecuting a whole part of our people because their skins is red and they're uneducated to our ways. And expansion ain't no excuse for taking Indian lands that was guaranteed to them. And Crockett is the only one who stands up, which I thought was, was wow. This was somebody of good character, who was genial, who was outgoing, but thoughtful a civic champion. He, he spoke up for people, you know, who didn't have a voice. And, and I think it was all based upon uh, that Crockett motto, be sure you're right. Be sure you're right, and then go ahead. And then go ahead. You know, to do the right thing, even though it may be unpopular. And so that just won over everybody. The first episode had created a flurry of excitement. But this second installment in 1955 ignited an utter phenomenon. Because that's when the buzz becomes a buzz and a half. Bill remembers the most feverish discussions happening in the bomb shelter in his school basement. When we had our periodic air raid drills, and you couldn't speak too loud because, you know, the teacher would get upset. But we had these little huddle groups and Davy Crockett just dominated the conversation. Kids didn't just want to talk about Davy, they wanted to dress like him. Disney's merchandising division was inundated with calls for Davy Crockett products. 
And Walt was completely unprepared. Disney had no idea what to do with this. He had done no strategizing, no copywriting, no trademarking. If you can even imagine it, Disney had no items to sell. And since he couldn't really put an exclusive claim on a historical figure, other manufacturers swooped in to meet the demand. With Crockett t-shirts, fringe jackets, and most important of all, coonskin caps. The cap was by far the biggest, which instantly identified you as a fan. My parents knew there was no choice. Gary's got to have a coonskin cap. I felt it was like the royal crown I should have. <laughs> the demand for caps sent the cost of raccoon tails soaring by more than 3,000%. When that supply got used up, they moved on to other animal pelts. And when that ran out, fake fur, plastic, even paper were used. In 1955, 10% of all children's clothing sales in America were for Crockett-related products. But that was only the start of the bonanza. I had Davy Crockett bedspread, lunchbox, coloring books. Everything and anything <laughs> that could be Davy Crockett was. Including uh, lamps, chalk, record players, hat racks, bicycle mud flaps, waste paper baskets, grills, board Oh, games, I had a Davy Crockett watch, batteries, too. I remember that now. Fabric, banks, wallets, decals, water pistols, badges, flashlights. Say, kids, isn't this a swell picture of Davy Crockett? Here's all you have to do to get your copy. Where'd you get that? Where'd you get this? Hey, Mom, look what they have. <laughs> Canned oysters, diaper beds, and pith helmets. <laughs> and even inexplicably, ladies' panties with the, with the Crockett name on them. A Time Magazine article estimated that sales of Crockett merch added up to $100 million. That's over $1.1 billion today. And this was after just three months. What fueled all this Crockett consumption was the same post-war affluence that drove the construction of suburbia. The rising middle class was all too happy to act on their impulses and show that they could treat their kids to whatever they wanted, basically. The coonskin cap chorus was growing too loud to ignore. Life magazine called the Crockett kids an army, raising bedlam indoors and out. The New Yorker declared it a Davy Crockett tidal wave. When Walt Disney was interviewed about this, he said, we had no idea what we were creating. There was no intention. There was no business plan. The lack of a plan became abundantly clear on February 23rd, 1955, when the next Davy Crockett installment aired on ABC. Because in episode three, coming at the height of the craze, Davy Crockett dies. First, as the Mexican forces lay siege to the Alamo, his sidekick Georgie Russell is mortally wounded. Give him one fur, Davy. Then, in the final shot, Davy Crockett swings his rifle as Santa Ana's troops surround him. That dissolves into the image of a waving flag. And then it's all over. What just happened? You know, and I'm like, whoa, you know, and I realize, you know, that's it for Davy. That's it. He's gone. And did that change how we talked about it with your friends, the, you know, the next day? You know, everybody talked about the, the, the battle and, and, you know, the gunfire stuff, and the, but no one talked about his on-screen exit. No one. Why do you think that is? I think it was like a member of our family had died. And you're in the funeral parlor, and you're speechless. Walt Disney kicked himself for his lack of foresight. He said Davy Crockett was one of the biggest overnight hits in TV history. And there we were, with just three films and a dead hero. But Crockett's TV death didn't end the craze any more than his real death killed his legend. Because in 1955, kids were resurrecting him 
on playgrounds across the country. Happened every day we could make it happen. Gary Foreman and his friends took full advantage of the half-built houses in a suburban Wisconsin subdivision. We created our own Alamos out there, you know, with dirt and rocks and building materials. Oh, we were building forts left and right, left and right. One day, they even rigged up sheets to convert their little red wagons into covered wagons. And then a group of older kids appeared on the horizon. And they had their heads shaved with the mohawk down the middle. And they came running at us screaming like the Indians and jumping over the wagons. And I remember firing with my flintlock and I started laughing hideously. This was like way too real. <laughs> Bill Shamerica didn't have that kind of open space where he lived in urban New Jersey. So our imaginations were taxed to their overtime limit to uh, make, you know, 24th Street appear like a, a river that Davy is trying to cross. But they found ways to make their industrial setting work for them. One block away, there was a huge embroidery factory, and we would go pick these huge cardboard tubes out of the dumpsters and use those as our rifles. Girls were out there on the battlefield, too. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, we had the sidearms and the rifle and everything the boys had. It, it, it was really very inclusive. I do not know of anyone who was not caught up in the Davy Crockett craze in 1955. And that didn't just include white suburbanites. Black newspapers spotlighted sing-alongs and performances and an L.A. birthday party with 65 kids and a Davy Crockett cake. Gary Foreman remembers having his own Crockett-themed party. <laughs> On my sixth birthday, I wanted them to sing, not Happy Birthday, Gary. I wanted them to have the same Happy Birthday, Davy Crockett. <laughs> Happy Birthday wasn't the only song people were singing. Number one, the top tune of the week, the song the survey finds in first place, the ballad of Davy Crockett. Davy, Davy Crockett, the king of the wild frontier. On March 26th, a recording of The Ballad of Davy Crockett by the actor Bill Hayes hit number one on the Billboard charts, and it would stay there for five straight weeks. He made himself a legend forevermore. Davy, Davy Crockett, the king of the wild frontier. We did have the record at home, which we played over and over. It was easy to listen to, it was catchy, and it told the story. And people love singing it. In 1955, it seemed the entire nation had the sound of the frontier stuck in their heads. Well, just like all of the rest of the 166 million people in this country of ours, I find myself walking around humming a certain tune, Davy Crockett. And according to Disney lore, this was all dumb luck. The song was hastily composed to fill out the hour schedule. It really wasn't anything planned. It was about a 15-minute job and ended up at the top of the charts for months. And it wasn't just the one version. Fess Parker had his own hit recording. And there were renditions by choirs and by jazz bands. <laughs> There were versions in Japanese and in Finnish. And naturally, there were parodies, like my favorite, a minor hit by Yiddish comedian Mickey Katz called Duvid Crockett. Born in the wilds of the Lancy Street, home of gefilte fish and kosher meat. Hand him it a knife for hairs of tea. You flicked him a chicken when he was only three. The Ballad of Davy Crockett, in all its forms, sold more than 10 million copies. It's been called the fastest selling entity in the history of the record industry. And Disney just did it overnight. Walt Disney had only made a TV show to get financing for his amusement park. But now that he had a craze on his hands, he was going to do whatever he could to keep it going. In an age long before VCRs, kids had no way to rewatch the show. So Walt ran the three episodes again for the second time in eight weeks. He then had them edited down into a movie and released to cinemas as Davy Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier. 
Did you go to see the movie in theaters when they repackaged the episodes as a feature film? What do you think? Of course I did. <laughs> On a giant screen in color? And we're all yelling, hurry up, Davey, go, go. There's a, a, a memorable scene where Davy Crockett goes to, you know, George Russell, you know, you know, if you get in any trouble, don't forget to whistle like a thrush. Like a Tennessee thrush. As soon as he did that, the entire audience of kids are imitating that bird. <laughs> Transformed the theater into a giant aviary. It was hilarious. It was just hilarious. Seeing Davy on the big screen was exhilarating. But even better was seeing him in person. In the summer of 1955, Fess Parker and his co-star Buddy Epson hit the road for a nationwide publicity tour. And we were all hoping that they would get to Wisconsin. Everyone said, if they show up, we're going to all be dressed and ready to go. They never did make it to Wisconsin, but they did get to Cincinnati and San Antonio and Birmingham and Memphis. At some stops, 20,000 rapturous children would greet them at the airport. When they came to a department store in Detroit, some schools just shut down for the day. And so when you see the Pope with the papal mass, we did that from the marquee of this jail Hudson's department store. This is Fess Parker in a 2000 interview for the Television Academy. It was impossible to speak to all of them. And so I developed a technique where I could shake hands, literally shake hands and look at a child and say hello. About 3,000 of them in an hour. Eventually, the tour would expand to Europe and Japan. But Fess Parker's most important stop would come on Sunday, July 17th, 1955, in Anaheim, California. This afternoon, Disneyland, the world's most fabulous kingdom, will be unveiled before an invitational world premiere, and you are guests. We'll be right back. On July 17, 1955, the gates of Disneyland would officially open. It would all be broadcast live on ABC. More than 20 cameras were stationed around the park, standing by for the big moment. And then, riding aboard a small train, the man who dreamed it all finally arrived. And now, Walt Disney will step forward to read the dedication of Disneyland. That was actor Ronald Reagan introducing Walt as he approached the podium. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Disneyland is dedicated to the ideals, the dreams, and the hard facts that have created America, with the hope that it will be a source of joy and inspiration to all the world. Thank you. Walt had been working toward this moment for years. Against all odds, he had brought his grand experiment to life. There was just one problem. On July 17th, this park was not ready for the public. Author Todd J. Pierce says that the first hints of structural work had only begun seven months earlier. The park is clearly not finished, but it needs to open then because Disney needs money. Even with all the revenue from the Disneyland TV series and merchandise sales and everything else, there wasn't nearly enough cash to cover the growing pile of unpaid bills. If Disneyland doesn't open in the middle of July, I think that there's a very strong likelihood that Disneyland Incorporated would have gone into bankruptcy. So Disney had no other choice. With the cameras rolling, they let in a horde of curious visitors eager to find out if the hype was for real. I think, ladies and gentlemen, that anyone who's been here today will say, as the people did many years ago, when they were at the opening of the Eiffel Tower, I was there. 28,000 guests walked through the gates that afternoon and funneled right into Disneyland's Central Boulevard, Main Street, USA. Main Street itself, at least part of it, had been paved that morning with asphalt. And so if you were to walk down Main Street, you would find that the ground is still squishy beneath your feet. Women's high heels got stuck in the asphalt as they made their way to the attractions, some of which still had construction crews who would duck out of sight whenever guests came by. Almost every ride broke down anyway. 
the Mark Twain steamboat took on a couple hundred passengers too many and nearly sunk. And at the Autopia racetrack, the cars were supposed to be kid-friendly. These are gasoline-driven, and the kids can drive to their heart's content. They only run 11 miles an hour, so they can't hurt anybody. But some of the fuel governors turned out to be faulty. People would be pushed off the road entirely and end up in the weeds. A kid lost his teeth and carried them around in his hand until he could get to first aid. And as the day wore on, everything just kept getting worse. There's not enough restrooms because there was a plumber strike. Trash begins to pile up. There was a gas leak in Tomorrowland. And all of this weighs very heavily on Walt. Walt knew that the park was filled with reporters. Some of them wrote reviews calling his dream project a nightmare. It would go down in Disney lore as Black Sunday. But once again in 1955, Walt Disney's savior was television. The park looked beautiful for the ABC cameras. The ABC team did a tremendous job. Now the parade is on. This is one of the greatest parades I've ever seen. And so the people that are in the park are frustrated, but people at home see this place that looks like a wonderful place to spend your vacation. For kids like Margaret King and Bill Shamerka, what showed up on their TV screens seemed magical. By that time, everybody was primed. We were all primed. This is so exciting. I have to see this place. Yes, it was a, a, a not-miss thing. Yeah, it sure is, but I still don't know where Davy Crockett is. Where's Davy Crockett? Where's Davy Crockett? The ABC cameras weren't going to leave the kids disappointed. At last, Fess Parker rode into Frontierland on horseback. We'd have been here sooner, but we took a shortcut through the Painted Desert. He was right there in the park, and that was just a thrill. Having him there says that this is the place where these characters exist, which then becomes a draw for the park itself. Around 70 million viewers tuned in to the opening day broadcast. That's out of an entire U.S. population of 165 million. For both Disney and ABC, it was yet another sign that this big, crazy TV gamble might just pay off. Since its debut, the Disneyland show had been drawing huge ratings every week. ABC had even ordered a second series to premiere in the fall of 55, The Mickey Mouse Club. Retailers were optimistic too. Considering how much Crockett merch they'd already sold, they couldn't wait to rake in the profits during the 1955 Christmas season. A lot of them thought it would just keep going year after year. But there comes a point where, you know, how much can this go on? Some of the boys are getting worn pretty thin, Colonel. I wonder how much longer our luck will hold up. The demise of the Davy Crockett craze began as an intellectual backlash. Academics and journalists scrutinized the historical Crockett and declared him an unfit hero. They said the real Davy was a self-serving hack and a shiftless brawler. The elites and the academics, they did point out some of his sketchier aspects, and they critiqued Disney for committing historical fiction, basically. As an editorial in Harper's put it, the Disney-fied Davy Crockett was as phony as the Russian legend about kind Papa Stalin. Soon, it wasn't just tweedy intellectual types taking swipes at Davy. In August, newspapers reported on an anti-Davy Crockett club in California. Its 10-year-old co-founder denounced the TV show as a scheme to sell coonskin caps. Everybody in our school's against him, he said. Frankly, we're bored by Davy Crockett. When did you notice that the craze was winding down? When they stopped singing the ballad of Davy Crockett. You know, we weren't listening to the record night and day. <laughs> when they went back to school in the fall of 1955, people didn't sport the coonskin cap. The National Retail Dry Goods Association lamented that kids are more fickle than women. The New York Times said that what seemed like an awesomely entrenched phenomenon now looked like a phenomenal bust. Pretty much the demand just fell off, and 
companies were stuck with warehouses full of these things, and there was no way really to sell any of this off. Disney actually revived Davy with two more episodes. They got good ratings, but nothing compared to the originals. Even Fess Parker noticed that kids weren't as excited to meet him. That was it. Less than a year after it began, the craze was over. In the spring of 1956, the Davy Crockett Museum got removed from Disneyland. The 9, 10, 11 year old kids were growing up. You know, you grow up. That's it. It's a, it's a new era. It's time to move on. For Walt Disney, this wasn't some great tragedy. He'd already gotten more from Davy Crockett than he'd ever hoped for. Disneyland would help transform his cartoon company into a cultural empire. And that might never have happened without the Davy Crockett TV show. It was a proof of influence for the medium that this wasn't probably going to go anywhere, and it had a lot more power and a lot more potential than anybody had ever thought. Disneyland would keep expanding, and the television audience would keep growing. But Davy Crockett was history. We loved Davy, and we had our time with him. We lived out his story, and that was all we needed to do. Because we were evolving. It was changing. We were growing up. We are getting a little bit older, and you move on to other things. And the next thing, it was something else replacing it. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock. In the summer of 1955, American youth once again launched an unexpected cultural phenomenon. And this one wouldn't fade away. On July 9th, a little more than three months after the Ballad of Davy Crockett hit the top spot on the charts, Rock Around the Clock went all the way to number one. Bill Haley didn't invent rock and roll. Black artists like Big Mama Thornton had been developing it for years. You ain't nothing but a hound. But Haley's song became rock's first number one single, propelled by its use in the teen drama Blackboard Jungle. Blackboard Jungle deals with an explosive subject, the teenage terror in the schools. I remember being inspired with awe. This is the experimental rock musician Frank Zappa reminiscing about the song. I didn't care if Bill Haley was white or sincere. He was playing the teenage national anthem, and it was so loud I was jumping up and down. Rock and roll became a phenomenon thanks to American teenagers, kids a little older than the ones who'd started the Crockett craze. But it didn't take long before everybody got on board. I went over to my, my good friend Lenny Heckel's house, and one day his... Uh, Older sister Patty is playing an album by Elvis Presley. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. And uh, things started to change. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. And I never made the connection that he was, you know, like like Davy Crockett. He was from Tennessee. So the guitar replaces the flintlock rifle. The guitar becomes a new symbol for America. Maybelline, why can't you be true? Chuck Berry's raucous playing on Maybelline helped define the sound of young America. Soon, other black pioneers like Little Richard and Fats Domino were finally scoring hits, too. Parents had mostly sanctioned Davy Crockett as wholesome. But when rock and roll crossed over to white teens, it was met by racist panic. There was a growing hysteria as adults feared that kids were spiraling into juvenile delinquency. Why I believe that is because I know how it feels when you sing it. I know what it does to you. The evil feeling that you feel when you sing it, and the beat. Like it or not, the young baby boomers were developing a culture of their own. They found their own music, movies, and fashions. Youth was a market. The Davy Crockett craze had shown that. They were discovered as an economic force that had never been seen before, never been realized before. Within a few years, Boomers would make up 40% of the entire U.S. population. As frivolous as all those coonskin caps may have seemed, they foreshadowed this new generation's economic, cultural, and political might. The baby boom had proven how much it could do, you know, just in a few months, acting as a unit. Cultural historian Margaret King wrote her dissertation on the Crockett craze to try to unravel 
why this character spoke to so many Americans in 1955. Heroes aren't just, you know, static figures. They're always changing depending on what kind of heroes we need. And Crockett, I think, really represented all the things that we like about ourselves. He's part of American exceptionalism, the self-made man. The individual is the core meaning for Americans. All crazes ultimately are mysteries. We can never truly know why they happen. And just as mysterious is why, for some people, one particular craze never wears off, even after the rest of the world moves on. I held on to it longer. I, had, I, I constantly was enthralled with him. As an adult, Gary Foreman immersed himself in the past as a historical reenactor. And he became a documentarian. His film about Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone aired on the History Channel. Sometimes we just don't realize the magic that starts in your childhood stays with you. That story was always fascinating to me. And of course, I became a history teacher, always teaching about, you know, Davy Crockett. In addition to teaching high school, Bill Chimerka founded the Alamo Society. He also became friends with Fess Parker and wrote a biography of him. You know, Davy Crockett said, you know, be sure you're right. And then go ahead. So I think I'm right, and I'm still trying to go ahead. He inspired me in a generation. Hopefully it'll carry on. Davy, Davy Crockett, leading the pioneer. Evan Chung is one year's senior producer. Next time. On One Year, 1955, a group of smart, talented women changed the face of television weather. They also stir up controversy when the broadcasts get sensual. Sex and weather. I like that description, actually. I mean, weather is somehow such a dry subject, isn't it? I mean, apart from being wet, it's dry. Sex and weather. What's wrong with that? Thanks so much for listening. If you want to hear more of One Year 1955 right away, we have some exciting news. You can hear the third episode of the season right now by subscribing to Slate Plus. That's right. Slate Plus listeners have exclusive access to the first three episodes of One Year 1955 in their feed now. And at the end of the season, Slate Plus subscribers will also get a member-exclusive episode with a whole new story from 1955. In addition, as a member, you'll also get every Slate podcast with no ads and never hit the paywall on Slate's site. And most importantly, you'll be supporting our work. If you'd like to sign up for Slate Plus, go to slate.com slash one year plus. Again, that's slate.com slash one year plus. This episode of One Year was written by Evan Chung. It was produced by Kelly Jones and Evan Chung with additional production by Sophie Summergrad. It was edited by me, Josh Levine, One Year's editorial director, with Joel Meyer and Derek John, Slate's executive producer of narrative podcasts. Our senior technical director is Merritt Jacob, and we had mixing help from Kevin Bendis. Holly Allen created the artwork for this season. Margaret King's dissertation is called The Davy Crockett Craze, A Case Study in Popular Culture. Todd J. Pierce's book on the building of Disneyland is called Three Years in Wonderland. Another valuable resource for this episode was Paul F. Anderson's book, The Davy Crockett Craze. You can send us feedback and ideas and memories from 1955 at oneyearatslate.com. And you can call us on the One Year Hotline at 203-343-0777. We'd love to hear from you. Special thanks to Christina Cotarucci, Madeline Ducharme, Forrest Wickman, Katie Rayford, Ben Richmond, Caitlin Schneider, Cleo Levin, Seth Brown, Rachel Strong, and Alicia Montgomery, Slate's VP of Audio. We'll be back next week with more from 1955.